Hi everyone and welcome to Art Laughs with me, Verity Babs. Today I speak to the comic and writer Ralph Jones. So I'm here today with Ralph Jones. Ralph, please introduce yourself. Hello there, my name is Ralph Jones. Um, I am a journalist and a comedy type. Um, I do lots of uh, writing for various um, people and places, so uh, mainly journalism, but also I write um, comedy sketches uh, with my sketch group, The Awkward Silence. I run an improv night called Criminal, which is uh, a murder mystery uh, themed gig. And I have a book coming out uh, in less than a month called How to Skim a Stone, unbelievably. Uh, so yeah, lots of fingers and lots of strange uh, strange pies. I wish we hadn't already picked a name for the series and call it Strange Pies. I think that's hard to <laughs> You picked an absolute belter of a painting for us today. Do you want to just introduce it to us? Yes. So um, this is uh, Flying Pig by Michael Sower or Sauer. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. And it's a picture of a pig leaping joyfully into a lake or a large pond. We don't know. Uh, and the inspiration for this was that I saw it in uh, the toilet of uh, my double act partner, Vivian Armand, and just thought it was absolutely beautiful and offered a kind of beautiful sense of promise. You know, there's possibility in the air as this pig leaps into the water. And so I was immediately taken by it. And about three or four weeks ago, bought a print of the painting and had it framed. And it is now in our new house on my right over here. Um, and uh, I loved it that much because it, it was a very impulsive purchase. It was very much like, now we've got our own place, let's fill it with pictures of pigs, um, among other things. It just was, it was the first thing I thought of because it uh, struck me as lots of promise in the air and lots of hope as this pig is kind of suspended in, in midair on its journey to the water. It's such, a joyous picture like when you sent it through to me I've just spent the the whole time smiling at it I think it's so brilliant <laughs> there are paintings that do this sort of whimsy or sort of comedy paintings that the main point is that they're funny or cute but with this one it's actually also really well painted and sometimes yeah. you miss out on that for you know a funny card design isn't actually well painted but the joke's there whereas this yeah. just feels so lovely and well done and I just want to be that pig really badly. Yeah, we all want to be that pig, yeah. It's, um, it's also quite a good metaphor, I think, for, I suppose, for comedy and art and comedy in general, because as well as being funny, you know, you, you want, when you do comedy, I suppose, for it to be um, aesthetically pleasing or kind of to have value beyond its um, vehicle as a joke. So you want it to look beautiful and you want it to kind of have dimensions beyond just being funny and so in this instance you know you could have the same premise a pig mm -hmm. leaping into into a pond um and then not have the technical ability to really make it particularly magnetic but i think as you say the marriage of those two um qualities makes for quite a an arresting piece because you know it's hard to look at it without smiling i think as you say i think i think i tend to um be drawn towards art that that is technically sophisticated and um if it's got a sense of humor then that's 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 my venn diagram really that's yeah. if i'm if i'm gonna blow you know 12 pounds 50 on a print or whatever then I, <laughs> I i want it to be ideally funny and ideally um well painted and i say that just because i have this kind of problem with modern art and i suppose more conceptual art which i can find very infuriating because technically it doesn't do anything for me because I think well I could have done that and I know that that's a very um uh immediate and kind of childish response but it means that I wouldn't particularly like to look at it in my um study for example just because I get frustrated that um if it's not particularly obvious that someone is is uh technically gifted that they've kind of achieved you know success as an artist I guess so I've always had that problem with with artists like um, Mondrian, 
um, and people like that who I'm sure were great painters, but who have become famous for things which are very, very um, basic. And in my in my teens, I was kind of in a state of uh, rebellion and thought it was very intelligent to go around saying that these people were um, not remotely talented, you know. But I still I, I think I'm maturing in that sense. But there's still an element of that going on in my in my brain at all times. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting looking at the artists that have become huge for their super abstract works and looking back at the work they did when they first started out and they're doing really nice portraits that look like (laughs) the people and lovely landscapes and then they choose to do this other thing. I think when I look at this piece, though, when you see this pig sort of suspended and, and it sort of ties in with your anger about these things, is that it almost feels like quite a nice snapshot of what it's like to work in the creative arts industry especially if you're doing a lot of freelance stuff there is an element of just sort of jumping and hoping that all works out and i guess in industries like writing and comedy there is such a level of grafting and crafting and becoming really good at what it is you do and still not being noticed so i can imagine why it's annoying to see people do things especially in visual art which is basically the platform where you can become biggest for doing very little yeah to be like well yes but I've spent really really long doing the thing I'm good at and this is not fair (laughs) yeah I think we're all the pig in a sense um that's the message of the painting uh I think that's true and yes there's this uh I don't know what to compare it to in terms of the moments in a freelancer's or a writer's or a creative artist's career Hmm. but there's that moment of um vulnerability where the pig is kind of committing entirely you know it's a hell of a it's a hell of a jump this pig is making it's a hell of a jump and has committed you know herself himself to leaping entirely into the unknown I guess I suppose the best metaphor for that is maybe when you deliver a line on stage or if you submit a piece of writing or just if you put an idea out there um you know that is the equivalent I guess that you're waiting to you're waiting and bracing for impact. Um, and so maybe subconsciously, that's why I like it, that uh, that the pig is kind of hopeful and, uh, and vulnerable. There's probably a lot more going on there than I realised. Well, it's like with criminal, improv is all about, I've made a decision to say this thing out loud. People are either going to like it or not like it. But now that I've said it, I've just got to run with it. Like this pig can't turn back now. You've made the jump and yeah. you've just got to carry on. Yeah, and the best improvisers um are those that own those decisions entirely um Mm. because it's all about confidence you know and the ones that doubt themselves and the audience therefore pick up on that doubt um are the ones i suppose that that will that will struggle a little bit more um and similarly here you know it wouldn't be so interesting a painting i think if the pig was sort of (laughs) half-heartedly um toppling into the water (laughs) <laughs> uh, you kind of yeah you kind of want in every element of life I suppose you what you feel inside is you know trepidation and uncertainty about almost almost every kind of commitment I guess but you want to see people who demonstrate the qualities that you don't necessarily have so the reason you pay lots of money to see you know shows plays comedians um, who are very good at what they do is because um you want that you want that certainty you want the um assurance mm. that someone knows what they're doing and uh i think the more i yeah the more i do the more i write and the more i learn about it um the more i realize that so much of it is just an illusion you know the the, the confidence um is is 90 percent of the um is 90 percent of the game really as a writer and a comic you're sort of taking lots of different parts of you know the arts has visual art ever been uh, played a big role in that i used to draw a hell of a lot Mm. and i used to kind of combine those two things because i would draw cartoons um caricatures of faces you know and they would all if i showed them to people they you know invariably they would kind of um make people laugh they weren't i don't think they were technically very good because they tended to be quite repetitive and if you ask me to draw anything other than a face, if you ask me to draw a horse, for example, I mean, it would be unrecognisable. It would, it would look like a pig. Um, <laughs> because you don't have that gift that people have for um, representing accurately what things look like. <laughs> hence, hence why 
I've never made it as a visual artist and also why um, I tended towards caricature because if I knew that I wasn't going to be able to draw someone very accurately then I would deliberately exaggerate their ears or their nose mm. and then that would be the focal point and people would say oh yeah it's fine that you clearly don't know what a hand looks like you've never seen a foot in your entire life <laughs> um, as long as you know it's, his face is quite mm. funny anyway so so yes I had, I had that history with it and then I suppose I started um, dabbling that again when I was a teenager probably or, or a bit younger um, drawing cartoons and stuff and then that did get sidelined I certainly didn't carry it on um, and actually doing this interview is a good uh, reminder that I, I don't appreciate visual art enough and um, again having our own place now means this urge to fill the space with yeah. um, with kind of weird and wonderful paintings go to museums and things and my parents are always very good at doing that that kind of cultural trip you know into London and stuff but I think it was often just wandering around museums and galleries not necessarily um not necessarily appreciating the art and now I guess I'm turning 31 in two days um I, I'm kind of old Happy enough birthday, now. Ralph. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now old enough maybe finally to take a step back and kind of appreciate it in in a way that isn't connected to school and isn't connected to parents and isn't connected to a sense of um, obligation. And it's more like, what's the kind of art that I want to fill my, um, yeah, to fill my life with? And that's a question that really I'm only just beginning to <laughs> ask. Really interesting you mentioning obligation. There's, you know, multiple reasons, but one of the big reasons about why people read more books than they go to art galleries or they uh, go to more comedy shows than they go to art galleries is you know obviously first of all you know you can pick up a book at home you can watch comedy online but then also you can go to an art gallery and you know possibly come out feeling really you know fulfilled and cultured but that's not the sort of happy hormone hit of going and having a laugh at some stuff and I suppose a large portion of going to a gallery is this sense of if I'm going to be the kind of adult who is respect <laughs> respectable and uh, you know respectable and well cultured and, and intellectual I ought to go to to art galleries and I mean I know I go to shows because it's sort of my job whereas if I'm going on holiday and whoever I'm going with says oh should we go to an art gallery I say no <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's hard to tell whether it is for the love of it or whether there is a sense of obligation there mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think for me anyway, I think a lot of it was uh, tied up with not only sense of obligation, but also a slightly pompous feel that museums can, um, uh, you know, inculcate where you feel as though you've got to take the art very seriously. It's set away. You can't touch it. Um, it's to be looked at and pondered over very seriously. And that's, again, why I suppose it's, you know, the, the comedian in me, but I think art that kind of pops that balloon, you know, um, and doesn't take itself too seriously. And I count the, the flying pig kind of in that, um, in that category because I think even a child would really enjoy looking at that. And um, maybe there's a sense there that art should be a little bit more about reconnecting with, with the childlike um, elements of life and also that museums maybe should I mean I'm not suggesting people should uh, be able to smear their sort of snot all over the um, paintings but I think there should be less of a sense of um, distance about these things and also more of a showcase of, 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 of um, more light-hearted stuff maybe I know there are places that do comedy and art um, you know the history of funny art for example mm. um, but I think that's very much a sort of specialist exhibition for example and um i think a lot of the spirit of uh the surreal and the funny is lost in the way in which museums present um art a lot of the time i remember the um is it the turbine hall in the tate yeah britain i think um in the, mo in the modern yeah in the modern yeah um i absolutely fell in love with that when I first went, I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, the first one I can remember 
the first exhibition or whatever you call them takeover of, of that space was the crack down the middle of the yeah. um, space. Now that, but that to me was completely fascinating because it was bending your perception, completely sort of distorting your perception of a space in a really visual and really interesting way. And obviously kids loved it, you know, and yeah, as much as, as much as old people. Maybe that's a big thing about being off put by the art gallery is you know right now they've got Kara Walker's fountain in there which again is brilliant and you can sort of interact with it you know you've got a young daughter that when you are first brought to an art exhibition as a child it is the first encounter you really have with there being rules about being formal and about not getting in anyone else's way and being quiet and not doing all the things that up until then your life has been full of touching things and you know licking stuff and running around so I suppose from the get-go, the first experiences we ever have with art galleries is about almost cutting off your senses other than the visual, which obviously is not how mm, children sure. work. So I guess that means that for the rest of our lives, when we do go to an art exhibition as you know, an actual adult, there is still this element of, today I'm being a grown-up and going to an art mm. exhibition, because this is what grown-ups yeah. do. You know? Yeah, I, I think there should be a room where you're allowed to lick all the paintings. That's, that seems very that seems very clear to me. Probably not this year. It won't get the green light. But you know, <laughs> once everyone's no. gotten over this whole co- coronavirus malarkey, I think we're like yeah, right yeah, yeah. licking licking turbine. <laughs> yeah, give it a couple of months and we'll be fine. Ralph, thank you so so much for coming on to the channel today. It's been great to have you. Could you let us know where we can follow all of your exploits? Yeah, sure. Um, so my website has uh, all of my uh, articles and. Um, details on that's mrralphjones.co.uk uh you can follow me on twitter if you wish um at oh hi ralph jones that's my twitter handle uh and um yeah and i sort of uh, pop up in various places um and uh yeah twitter is probably the best place to keep track of the various uh, various things i'm doing Thanks so much for watching. You can follow Ralph in the ways written below. As per usual, you can follow me at Verity Babs Art on Instagram. Please do give us a subscribe and a like, etc. And I will see you next time.